All right. Yeah. Here we go. Oklahoma City, homegrown. Yes. Jeff Tubin. Um, Jeff, I'll never forget covering the Oklahoma City bombing. I was anchoring the Today Show when it happened. I think we stayed on the air, obviously, because it was a huge news story. But it was also pure pandemonium initially. And every expert we had on that morning, I'll never forget it, said it was Middle Eastern terrorists. Why was that the automatic default? Why was that the automatic default explanation? Well, I, t- to answer that question, I think there, there are two. I g- I'll give you two explanations. One, which is the more, um, under, the, I guess the fairer one, is it had been a little more than two years since um, the first World Trade Center uh, bombing. And Ramzi Youssef, the mastermind, had just been arrested in February of 1995, just you know, a little more than two months before the Oklahoma City bombing. So the issue of Islamic terrorism was very much in the mix. So that is, is to me, a kind of reasonable re- reason to at least raise the possibility. The more sinister and disturbing explanation is that um, it was a... Um, assumption that Americans couldn't do this and and that this is just something Americans do not do. And that was was pernicious and wrong. And fortunately, the evidence came out so quickly about McVeigh's involvement. But the the urge to blame foreigners for something that Americans do do or did is 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 a profound one and 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 a bad one but that's what I think that's that's the negative explanation of what was going on that that um, that morning this is a continuing pattern in American life and it is something that has gone on with the Oklahoma City bombing even after it's been convincingly proved that Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols acted alone. There is a political interest, especially on the American right, you know, in the right wing, to say that we don't do this, that this, th- these, these kinds of acts are not us. And the desire to push the, expl- to push the responsibility onto Islamic terrorists as opposed to the right wing Americans who did it, it's a political act. I mean, it, it is an attempt to steer responsibility away from political, if not allies, people who are at least somewhat sympathetic to you. So, you know, it, it's it it is a it is a bad thing that um, we um, try to blame uh, foreigners for acts that very clearly um, are entirely native grown. Your book is so well written and and actually thrilling to read in terms of the suspense and everything that transpired before and after Oklahoma City. I'm curious why you decided to write about this. You've written nine books, everything from O.J. to Patty Hearst. And what caught your eye or your attention about Oklahoma City? Well, sometimes when, when I've had book subjects, it's just sort of evolved. This book arose from something very specific. In October of 2020, um, the FBI arrested a number of people in the conspiracy to kidnap Governor Whitmer of Michigan. I started looking into that, and it became very clear almost from the start that most of the perpetrators were involved with the Michigan militia. I had covered the McVeigh and Nichols trials in 1997. Unlike you, I didn't cover the bombing itself in 95. I didn't go to Oklahoma City when it was still, you know, in ruins, but I did cover the trial. So I knew the facts in a, in a more detailed way than I know most stories from that long ago. And I knew that Terry Nichols and his brother James had been affiliated with the Michigan militia. And so I thought to myself, I know these people. I know what they believe. And any so I started, you know, working, you know, trying to figure out what was going on there. It was only, you know, right after the election, January 6th, that, of course, January 6th happened. 
And it was quite clear to me that the people who were the co-conspirators in the Whitmer kidnapping attempt and the January 6th people were very similar. That, in turn, reminded me that they were like McVeigh and Nichols. So that story, the, the connection between McVeigh and Nichols and what came, you know, just recently was really what prompted me to write the book. The, it, it's, it, and, and just from a purely book writing perspective, I looked around and I saw there has been very little written about the Oklahoma City bombing um, in, in subsequent years. And I found, much to my surprise and delight, that there was this uh, unbelievable source of information at the Briscoe Center at the University of Texas that no one, almost no one had ever looked at. I just want to point out, just as a personal, on a personal note, you covered the the Nichols trial, I think, with my late husband, Jay Monahan, right? I, I, I covered OJ with Jay. I covered uh, all the big trials of the 90s I covered with Jay. I, I remember, I remember in, in your living room him showing off his stack of pleadings. Uh, I believe that was from OJ that he had been studying. So yes, indeed, I certainly covered more than one trial with Jay. Jeff, talk about this treasure trove of files donated by McVeigh's lead attorney, a man I interviewed many, many times because he did love the camera, (laughs) to the University of Texas. So first of all, why did he donate them and how helpful were they in writing this book? You know, Katie, I have spent my entire career covering the law and often covering trials and the aftermath of trials. And it was the ultimate dream come true to find this archive. Stephen Jones was the lead attorney for Timothy McVeigh. He assembled at government expense an enormous team of lawyers, like a dozen lawyers, investigators. They traveled all over the world and they interviewed their client multiple times. And as a result, every time one of them interviewed their client, they would write a memo about what McVeigh said and then send it around to everyone. What Stephen Jones did, which I had no idea about until I started looking into this, is he donated everything, every scrap of paper in connection with uh, the McVeigh case to the Briscoe Center at the University of Texas. Now, if there are any lawyers listening, or uh, the first question anybody says is, how can a lawyer do this? What about attorney-client privilege? Mm -hmm. What about client confidences? What a a client tells his lawyer is protected forever, and that is true even if the client dies, as Timothy McVeigh was executed in 2001. So how could Jones have done this? Well, that's a question that I put to him, and it's a question he's addressed in various forms. And his view is that uh, McVeigh, by attacking Jones later after his um, conviction, effectively waived the attorney-client privilege. I don't think that's true. I don't think it's accurate. But who would sue Jones anyway? Well, that was the thing. And it is also true that Jones took a $300,000 tax deduction for giving it to um, the University of Texas, which was ultimately disallowed by the courts. Um, That could be one motivation. But in fairness to Stephen Jones, another thing he has said is he realizes how important this case was. And he wrote, quoting Felix, Felix Frankfurter, history, too, has its rights. And he wanted the opportunity to have the story told. This was before I started writing the book. But you know, I have to, I, it, it would be churlish and unfair of me to criticize Stephen Jones too much for this since I was such a beneficiary of it. But the answer to your question is, I don't think he had the right to give this stuff away. I don't think it was right. I thought he was subject to um, discipline from the Bar Association. Hasn't happened, but I don't think this is what a pr- proper behavior for a lawyer just, but it's not my problem. But thank you, Stephen. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's why <laughs> I helping have me write ambivalence this book. about it. And are yeah. you the first author that really had, you know, combed through these files? Because other people have written about Timothy McVeigh. I, I, I'm not the first person to have looked at any of it. 
Uh, I don't know that it's ever been cited before. I'm certainly the first person to look at it in detail. And um, it, it's been there since the early 2000s, but almost no one has looked at it as far as I was aware. Let's go back to those days, Jeff, when you were covering the McVeigh and Nichols trials in 1997. You write that you, quote, failed to understand, much less explain, McVeigh's place in the broader slipstream of American history. With the benefit of hindsight now and a reexamination of everything that happened before and after the Oklahoma City bombing, how have you come to understand Timothy McVeigh differently? You must feel at this point you know him pretty intimately. I do. I do. And, and, um, I, and I do feel that um, the picture of him that I and others presented, it wasn't exactly inaccurate, but it was very much incomplete. The um, the picture that you got of Timothy McVeigh from my work, and I think from most coverage in, in, in the mid-90s, was of a lone eccentric, a, 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 a lone wolf, someone who was um, fueled by his own idiosyncratic grievances uh, to do these terrible acts. And what the documents that I found at the Briscoe Center and all of my reporting um, proved to me was that's wrong, is that Timothy McVeigh was part of a movement. He was a, he, a, a, a phrase you to this day often hear about McVeigh is that he was anti-government. That's wrong. He was not anti-government. He was not an anarchist. He was anti this, the government in power then, Bill Clinton's government. He was a right-wing extremist. He was not an anarchist. He was part of the movement of Newt Gingrich. He was part of Rush Limbaugh's Ditto Head audience. One of the things he talked about with his lawyers often is that as he went for these very long drives around the country, um, whether he was going from his home in, near Buffalo um, to visiting Nichols in Michigan to visiting his friend uh, in Arizona to visiting the scene of Waco or his sister in Florida, these incredibly long drives, he was always listening to Rush Limbaugh. I mean, he was part of the right-wing movement of the 1990s. And one haunting thing he said to his lawyers was, I knew there was an army out there an army out there of people like me, but I never found it. And he didn't because he didn't have the tools. And just to get to you know one of the larger points of the book, which is the difference between McVeigh and January 6th is the internet and, 19, and social media. Because the people who wanted to kidnap Governor Whitmer, they could find each other on Facebook uh, private chats. If you look at some, so many of the right ring, um, uh, the, the people who shot, the, the guy who shot up the Walmart, the guy who shot up the grocery store in, uh, in Buffalo. The Tree of Life. Uh, the Tree of Life guy in Pittsburgh. All of them were radicalized uh, online. In, uh, online. And McVeigh didn't have that, and he didn't have the opportunity um, to to find others, even though he was looking. I was going to say, having said that, Jeff, there there were people out there, and there were people organizing in a you know less efficient way back then, right? Th- th- there were. I mean, there were right wing extremists. You know, he was. Um, uh, McVeigh was obsessed with the book *The Turner Diaries*, this terrible dystopian novel about um, a, a supposed takeover of the federal government by blacks and Jews, and then the counter-revolution led by the hero of the book, Earl Earl Turner. And it was found in the back seat of his car. Uh, there, there were excerpts from it found, and he would go to gun shows and sell copies of it. Uh, that was one of the ways he tr- he made a very meager living was selling copies of *The Turner Diaries*. That novel had lots of readers then. I mean, there were people who agreed with him. I'm surprised he didn't meet more like-minded people at the aforementioned gun shows and well, during his travels selling this this horrible propaganda. That's where you get to McVeigh's personality, which was not that 
of, of a charismatic leader. He was not someone who could recruit others. He could not, you know, talk to other people and, and, and bring them in, as he, as he sort of acknowledged to his, to his, uh, to his lawyers. Um, so he did, and, and that, but that was the idea. He, was, he went to these gun shows to try to find like minded people. To find, but but it, 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 never, it never worked to the extent someone actually joined in the conspiracy. Tell us a little bit about Timothy McVeigh's personality because it, it was so long ago. And of course, his picture and his photograph loom large in my mind. But about his just sort of what was this guy like? Loner, kind of unable to attract girls. A real, a, you describe him, I think, as a modern day incel Absolutely. in some ways. But tell tell us a little bit more about him as a person. Well, the, the let's start with where he grew up, outside Buffalo. His father worked at a GM plant um, that, that made mostly air conditioners for 30 years. His grandfather worked at the same GM plant for 30 years. There was a stability in that community that by the time Tim was growing up uh, was, was gone. There were 9,000 people who worked in that plant at one point. It, it's down to 1,000 now. It's, it's, it's still open. But the option of going into the, the family business, as it were, was not available to him. So this sense of economic dislocation was, was a big part of it. Also, his parents had a um, unhappy marriage. Um, the, and and here, here's where, you know, a lot of people's parents have unhappy marriages, but here there's a particularly distinctive fact that to me always seemed highly relevant. There, in the family, there were two daughters and um, one son, and McVeigh was in the middle. The mother kept moving out during his teenage years. She, she would move to Florida for a while. She moved elsewhere in the Buffalo area. And every time she moved away, she took the two daughters, but not Tim. And it always seemed to me like a kind of Sophie's Choice situation where your mother like doesn't pick you. And that, I think, had a, had a psychological impact on him. And he, the way he talked about his mother with tremendous bitterness that she was a drunk and a slut and who knows when and any of that was true. But that anger against women came through in his later life. After high school, he went to a business college for a while, didn't do well there. He enlisted in the army. He was a very good soldier, a very effective soldier, won a Bronze Star in the, in the first Gulf War. But when he came back, he tried out for the Green Berets for special forces, and he bombed out of the test almost immediately. So he was at complete sea in his life uh, because he really wanted to be in special forces. And so in, the, in 1991, 92, that was when his life sort of fell apart because he wasn't in the military. He couldn't make a connection with a woman. He had no uh, financial prospects. There was nothing for him in Buffalo. And that's when he turned to the political extremism. A lot of depictions of McVeigh portray him as sort of a freakish outsider. But you make the point that his views were very much aligned with sort of mainstream Republican uh, doctrine at the time, right? That's right. I mean, you, you, it's it's important to remember sort of what was going on in American politics at that point. You know, Newt Gingrich, in, in 1994, um, Newt Gingrich uh, the led, the Republic, with le, led the Republicans with the contract with America to uh, a huge victory in the midterm elections where they retook the House, they retook the Senate, and, and Bill Clinton was was almost a, a, a marginal figure. Um, in, in the lead up to the 94 elections, one of the ways Bill Clinton wanted to restore you know, some sort of political success was in September of 1994, he succeeded in getting Congress to pass the assault weapons ban over furious Republican opposition. That was the act that convinced McVeigh to conduct the bombing. You know, 
I think many people may remember that McVeigh was anguished and very angry about the situation in Waco when the FBI raided the, the, the Branch Davidian compound. Seventy-six people were killed. And that's true. But people forget how angry he was about the assault weapons ban, which was a very conventional Republican view. Now, obviously, most Republicans did not engage in terrorism. But he, his, his views were an exaggerated version of very, cons- very conventional Republican views of that era. Let's listen to Bill Clinton as he's signing the assault weapons ban on September 13th, 1994. This bill makes it illegal for juveniles to own handguns. And yes, Without eroding the rights of sportsmen and women in this country, we will finally ban these assault weapons from our street that have no purpose other than to kill. Gosh, it could be yesterday. I was going to say this yesterday. I find this frightening because there is a big move to once again. By the way, the assault weapons ban expired. It had a t- it had a ten year sunset. Right. And by that point, George W. Bush was president, and there wasn't even an attempt to re- bring it back. Right. But now there are a lot of cries, given all the school shootings and the use of AR-15s and so many of these mass murders. And I'm a little worried, just hearing Timothy McVeigh's reaction to Bill Clinton, that God. What would happen if if the assault weapons ban went into effect again? Not that I think that's likely, by the way. Well, right, but but when um, you see McVeigh's reaction and you see McVeigh's obsession with gun rights in the Second Amendment, it is one of the clearest connections between McVeigh and January 6, 2021, that the the fixation of gun rights on the right is so intense and so powerful and um, really bigger than any other issue, bigger than abortion, bigger than taxes. That's what they that's what the, the, the modern right wing cares about. And it's what McVeigh cares about, cared about. And and I, I, I think you're right that the passion on that issue is just as great now. I remember hearing Chris Murphy of Connecticut, though, talking about how guns have been a become a proxy for so much more than just Second Amendment rights. I I couldn't agree more, which makes it all the more um, important to people. Because if you are saying to someone, I want to uh, limit, limit, limit or eliminate your right to buy an AR-15, you're not just talking about AR-15s, you're talking about an entire worldview. It becomes an existential threat to you as a person taking away your, your assault weapon. And that's how McVeigh saw it, and that's how a lot of people see it today. You talk about Timothy McVeigh's personality, but what about Terry Nichols? He helped him build the bomb, right? And um, how did those two hook up? And you have Mike Fortier as well. Um, the three of them met on the first day of basic training uh, when they all enlisted in the Army in 1988. But they were three very different figures with some aspects in common. Uh, McVeigh was from uh, outside Buffalo, a land of industrial decline. Terry Nichols was from the thumb of Michigan, an area of agricultural decline. His family were small farmers who just couldn't make it anymore. And and so in that respect, their lives were very, were very parallel. Mike Fortier was from a, uh, a grim town called Kingman, Arizona, and all he wanted to do was get high and was different from the two of them and was not actively involved in the conspiracy. But knew about he it. He knew about it, but he did not participate in it. But... Um, Nichols is a very different personality than than McVeigh. McVeigh was an evil person. He was also highly intelligent, effective, organized, resourceful, and really smart in certain ways. Nichols was 
a screw up from the day from day one, whose life w- he cascaded from one failure to the next. You know, he he bombed out of his attempt to go to college. He never really got got a job. He moved to Las Vegas to try to find a job. You know what? It's easy to find a job in Las Vegas. He moved there twice and couldn't find a job in Las Vegas. He was married to a woman in Michigan. She dumped him while he was in the army. He goes to the Philippines and gets a mail-order bride, a 16-year-old, who he was pleased to report weighed less than 100 pounds because he he needed a docile, um, you know, help meet, Um, even though she wound up, you know, not very happy with him either. I mean, he, left to his own devices, would never, I think, have conducted the Oklahoma City bombing on his own, but led by McVeigh, uh, did participate in the conspiracy. Mike Fortier ended up uh, basically cooperating with the government. He became the star witness for the government in in its case against McVeigh. Again, a screw up, but a different kind of screw up. Right. Um, He married his high school girlfriend and they would you know, he, he worked at a just above minimum wage job at a hardware store, just enough money to buy crystal meth and pot. And and that's what they did all the time. And he had sort of vague libertarian views. He had the uh, the Gazden flag, the the yellow flag that people know with the, the snake that, right. uh, that, 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 don't, that... Don't tread on me. Don't tread on me, which, um, you know, is, is a symbol of the right wing. But he was not especially political. And McVeigh, in these endless travels around the country, would, uh, would sometimes go to Kingman, Arizona, and visit with uh, Mike and Laurie Fortier. And, and try to get them involved in the conspiracy. And at one point, um, they drove across the country together and McVeigh took him to Oklahoma City and said, look, this is where I'm going to set off the bomb. The, the, the horror of Mike Fortier's story is that if he had gotten off his ass and r- made one phone call to the FBI and said, stop this guy, because he's really going to do it, he could have saved dozens and dozens of lives. So Mike Fortier is not an honorable person in this. And he wound up pleading guilty to a variety of charges, um, lying to the FBI and whatnot, that landed him in prison for for about eight years. But it is fair to say he was not an active conspirator in someone, you know, helping McVeigh and Nichols to actually set off the bomb. Meanwhile, Terry Nichols is currently serving a life sentence without a possibility of parole. My understanding is he has expressed some contrition. I know you tried to get an interview with him. What are your impressions of how he views his participation? I've heard a variety of things about Terry Nichols uh, over the years. Uh, you know, he, he is in the Supermax prison in Florence, Colorado, where they are locked down 23 hours a day except for an hour of recreation in a, in a little cage. Uh, from what I understand, it's driven him pretty crazy, as it well might. I mean, that is a pretty rough way to spend, to spend your life. Um, I don't know that he has contrition. I, I don't know what he's thinking. As, as you mentioned, I reached out to him. I wrote him a bunch of letters, never heard back. Um, he's, his, his mail order bride has moved back to the Philippines with their, their child. Um, it's a, um, it's a, I don't feel sorry for Terry Nichols, but, but it is a sort of pathetic story. I'm curious how McVeigh's and Nichols' convictions galvanized the right wing. You know, you were earlier, he had a hard time, and of course he wasn't a very charismatic person who could recruit other people. But what impact did the trial and the conviction have on this growing movement of right-wing extremists in this country? Um, a, a tremendous effort to distance McVeigh from the movement. Um, there was a full congressional investigation in the uh, later 90s uh, led by a congressman from, from California, Dana Robacher, who met, I won't say manufactured, but used really bogus evidence to suggest that Terry Nichols was really in league with Islamic terrorists. Um, it, it, was, it's, it, was, it was ridiculous, but I think it's, it's, it, it was part of the effort that um, 
the, of the, the right wing. of the right wing to say, well, he really wasn't one of us. Just like after January sixth, you heard from Donald Trump and others that it was really well Antifa from the left wing agent provocateurs who were really just trying to discredit our movement. That these bogus explanations come up every time the right wing. Uh, the right wing does something. And and the use of the term, for example, anti-government to describe McVeigh uh, as if he was someone like Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, who was genuinely a loner, who was genuinely anti-government in the sense of all against all government. That attempt to associate McVeigh like Kaczynski is an effort to to uh, distance McVeigh from the right wing. Do you think anyone else was involved? I don't. I, I, you know, this is something I took very seriously because, you know, this is there, there have been now on the left. Interestingly, just as there's been an attempt on the right to distance um, McVeigh from the right wing movement, there's been an attempt on the left to associate McVeigh with the broader right wing movement and to suggest that there were lots of people who wanted to blow up the Murrah building. You know, shortly before um, uh, April 19th, 1995, McMay- McVeigh made a call to a guy um, named Andre Strassmeyer at the um, Elohim City, which was a right wing compound uh, near the Arkansas Oklahoma border. And, and some have suggested that that meant that McVeigh was um, in cahoots. In cahoots with this broader right wing movement. Every piece of evidence I've seen said that they never actually made the connection. They had met at a gun show. McVeigh was looking for a place to go after the bombing. He never even reached Strassmeyer on the phone. There is absolutely no evidence that I've seen that anyone was involved in this bombing except McVeigh, Nichols, and Fortier in the sense that he knew about it, even if he didn't participate. You interviewed President Clinton for your book. And he told you that he was almost immediately convinced that this was homegrown terrorism. This, to me, was the most interesting reporting experience I had when I was working on homegrown. Just because of the order you do reporting, you you never know exactly how it's going to unfold. I had interviewed several people who were in the White House on April 19, 1995. And as you pointed out, a lot of people on television were saying, these were Islamic terrorists, like the first World Trade Center bombing. And these were people who were in the Oval Office with Clinton at the time. And Clinton, of course, didn't say this publicly. He didn't want to prejudge the investigation. But he said to them, this was not foreign. This was homegrown. These were the militias. I know these people. And so when I went to interview Clinton after talking to these other people, I said to him, well, how did you know? that it was domestic, when everybody was saying that it was foreign. And he proceeded to tell me, you know, I knew these people from Arkansas. And then he started reciting chapter and verse of right-wing extremism, including some very violent, deadly stuff that he had dealt with in Arkansas when he was governor. And meanwhile, I'm interviewing Bill Clinton in 2022, and he is telling me, about day-by-day events in 1983, 84, 85. I went back and checked it out. He, his memory was impeccable. So it was fascinating to me that Clinton understood the anger, the passion, the violence that was so um, evident in the militia movement. And he saw in the Oklahoma City bombing before the experts did who was really behind it. Doesn't that lend a little more credibility, though, to the notion that somehow McVeigh, if these people were making their their feelings known and Bill Clinton kind of predicted right away that they were responsible, that perhaps Timothy McVeigh had some connection with these people? Well, I think it lends credence to McVeigh's statement to his lawyers, there's an army out there. I know there's an army out there. But you know, and here's here's where you get into the nitty gritty of the evidence of the case. And this this to me is just such a perfect like little nugget that that it, it tells you so much. McVeigh and Nichols um, wanted to cover their tracks. They knew they were in Gallup. And they in one of the right wing magazines they read called The Spotlight, they found an ad 
you can buy a, a phone card. You may remember. You're far too young to remember this, <laughs> Katie. Oh, yeah. But it used to be that you would have phone cards I where you this. would punch in a code if you wanted to make a long distance call. And they figured, oh, well, if we buy this phone card from this magazine, no one will ever, no one will ever find it. Well, when they searched Terry Nichols' house after the uh, the bombing, they found the card itself and they reconstructed every long distance phone call they made from the beginning of the conspiracy to April 19th. And they found all the um, fertilizer stores where they bought the fertilizer, they found the fuel oil, they found the, the rider rental, tr- rental car places. If it wasn't on the phone card, they didn't do it. They didn't make the call. So the fact that they were able to show who they were in contact with showed they were not in touch with the people from Ella Home City. They were not in touch with other co-conspirators because they had, in essence, this diary of all their contacts. Fascinating. Um, yeah. And I sometimes think that the government doesn't get enough credit. I mean, the way they handled the aftermath of Oklahoma City, the fact that he was arrested, Timothy McVeigh, what, 90 minutes after the bombing by a very alert state trooper, um, who noticed his license plate was missing? Right, yeah, Jeff? There, there's a lot. There's some there, was serendipitous, there, and some was was just really good investigation. I, I right? mean, you know, the FBI gets criticized for a lot, and and for good reason. They did a superlative job, and Trooper Charlie Hanger um, the, also did something amazing. But just to, to to remind people how this all unfolded, the the bombing took place uh, at 9:02 a.m. on April 19th. Um, it was this horrible explosion. And then uh, two blocks away, something came spinning through the air and nearly crushed someone who was in a Ford Fiesta right right there. It was a truck axle. It, and um, the, the FBI, underst- everybody could tell this came from very far away. The, the, for, the um, axle had a VIN number, a vehicle identification number on it. It's traced to Ryder Truck Rental. Ryder says that truck was rented in Junction City, Kansas, by a guy named Robert Kling, K-L-I-N-G, um, three days earlier. FBI agents go. They fan out over um, the city, Junction City, Kansas. They go to all the motels. They go to they go to um, the Dreamland Motel, this this kind of sleazy motel right by the highway. And they ask the proprietor, and they say, has anybody been here with a rider truck? And they say, yeah, a guy parked a rider truck three days ago, and he, and he stayed here. What was his name? Timothy McVeigh. So what – and then they found that that person had ordered Chinese food um, from, from the Hunam restaurant, and he had registered – he had – he he had ordered food from room 25 because they had the phone records under the name Timothy McVeigh, uh, under the name Robert Kling. Oh. So that's how they discovered that Robert Kling and Timothy McVeigh were the same person. He used Timothy McVeigh to rent the hotel room. What a dope. It I guess was, he had was, to because well, maybe no, a credit card. He no, no, it was, it was all cash. He was careless. He made a mistake. He, but he had ordered Chinese food under the same name as he rented the car. And then and the then, state trooper. And then the state trooper. Again, the crazy coincidences. Charlie Hanger, um, who I have to say is like the coolest guy in the world. I was I interviewed him. Ninety minutes after the bombing, he is he is pissed because he wants to be sent to Oklahoma City where all the action is. But they say no, continue your regular patrols. He sees a broken down old Mercury Marquis driving north away from Oklahoma City with no license plate. He pulls over. He pulls the car over. And as the guy gets out of the car, the driver of this car, he sees as his jacket opens that he's carrying a gun. And he spins him around and puts and, um, you know, fr- puts him against the, the car, uh, you know, to frisk him. And, and McVeigh says to him, you know, that gun's loaded. And Charlie Hanger puts the gun to McVeigh's, the base of McVeigh's skull and says, so is mine which is like the badass line of all time. I just love that. Uh, anyway, um, he, he brings him in because in, in Oklahoma at that time, 
to carry an unregistered gun is a crime. Let's fast forward to today when the right-wing government of Oklahoma has dis- has ended that requirement. If Tim McVeigh had been arrested today, Charlie Hanger couldn't have arrested him. All he could have done is give him a ticket for having an un- uh, no license plate because it's legal now to carry an unlicensed gun in, in Oklahoma. Anyway, so uh, M- McVeigh is sent to um, the, uh, the, 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 the prison in Perry, Oklahoma to, you know, to face charges of, uh, having an unregistered gun and, uh, he has to sort of wait until his case is called. Well, the judge, the judge's son misses his bus to Stillwater. So he has to be held overnight. There's no one to arraign him. Then the next day there's a contentious divorce. And so the judge can't hear the, the case. It takes, you know, 48 hours for the FBI to make the connection. They put McVeigh's name in the database of people arrested and they discover we have this guy in custody in Oklahoma. They call the the, the courthouse and the, and, the, and the jail and they say, do you have a guy named Timothy McVeigh there? Yeah, we're about to release him because it was such minor charges. And they start screaming, don't release him, don't release him. And they send a helicopter and that's how they get him. But anyway, so it's a combination of great de- 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 detective work, but also the serendipity of McVeigh not only being arrested, but being held for two days on these really minor charges because the judge couldn't get around to his case. I know the book has been optioned for a scripted series, and it's pretty much writing All itself right, right well, here, I right? I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> from, from my lips to God's ears, yeah, that's right? That's the spirit. Um, let's talk about the remarks Bill Clinton delivered at the memorial service at the Oklahoma Fairgrounds. You describe it as one of the most consequential of his presidency. Why was it such an important address? Well, the the national feeling of horror and outrage was was really profound. I mean, remember, this is 1995. It's before 9-11. There has really never been an event like this in modern uh, American history. And Clinton, who, you know, he wasn't a senator. He was a governor. So he had done a lot of funerals. He had comforted people. And, you know, the thing that many people to this day remember about Bill Clinton is that he felt other people's pain. And in his speech at the Oklahoma City Fairgrounds, you know, he he really captured that feeling of uh, national sorrow and national purpose in a way that was where he really rose, rose to the occasion. And after losing control of the House and Senate in the uh, previous midterms, midterms, November, this is only five months later, this was really the beginning of Bill Clinton's political resurrection, which continued into his reelection the following uh, the following year. You recently wrote a piece for The New York Times really comparing Merrick Garland's response and timeline after January 6th to the way he dealt with the Oklahoma City bombing. And and again, you, you have to remember what was going on at the same time. The Oklahoma City bombing is April of, of 1995. The O.J. Simpson case is at its peak of uh, national obsession in that, at that time. On the April 19th, that's where I was. I was covering the O.J. Simpson case. Garland was repelled by all the publicity and the way the prosecutors got so much attention and the way there was so much, um, you know, craziness associated with O.J. He has this tremendous aversion to public uh, publicity about legal matters. He thinks it should be dealt with just just in the courtroom. In his role in 1995 and 1997, I can understand that. One ground for criticism, I think, of him in 1997 is we needed to we we need to hear more of the Merrick Garland from his confirmation hearings. He has essentially stopped talking about uh, the investigation of of January 6th. He says, you know, you can get into trouble if you if you give too much pretrial publicity. That's true only in the most extreme cases. We have a situation now where Donald Trump 
and much of the Republican Party is trying to revise the history of January 6th, is trying to say these people are political prisoners, that what they did was not, was, was not so terrible. And, and Garland, with this aversion to publicity, which was born in the OJ case in 1995, is staying on the sidelines uh, as a public figure. And I, and I think that's a disappointment, but I think it's also something that can be traced to what went on in the mid-90s. He has an aversion to publicity, but also to making a broader political statement, right, with his, with his cases. Absolutely. And, and, you know, Bill Clinton, in addition to the speech um, at the Oklahoma City Fairgrounds, which was not political, he gave a series of speeches um, in the spring and summer of 1995 where he was saying, look at the violence in the language of people on talk radio about politics today. And, you know, Rush Limbaugh knew who that was directed at, and he was all wounded innocence, like, don't blame me. Neither one of them knew how right Clinton was, that, that, that Clinton, that, that McVeigh was inspired. Uh, by Rush Limbaugh style rhetoric. And that um, is something that now as Attorney General, McVeigh, um, Garland could be saying, but he chooses not to. In fact, we have some sound of Rush Limbaugh from 2010 trying to connect Bill Clinton and Janet Reno to the Oklahoma City bombing and Waco. Let's listen to that. Let me ask you a question. What was a more likely cause of the Oklahoma City bombing? talk radio or Bill Clinton and Janet Reno's hands-on management of Waco, the Branch Davidian compound, and maybe to a lesser extent, Ruby Ridge. Don't forget that the, the Oklahoma City bombing occurred two years to the day after the Waco invasion. President Clinton's ties to the domestic terrorism of Oklahoma City are tangible. Talk radio's ties are non-existent your reaction? Wow, I never heard that before. That's fascinating. I, I, I and and perverse in in the extreme is that by supervising the situation in Ray, in Waco, where tragically so many people died, seventy six people died. Bill Clinton should have known. Rush Limbaugh says that that was going to lead to Timothy McVeigh's violence, which is so perverse and crazy that. Um, I, it's even hard to know um, how to how to respond to it, but it is indicative of how the right is trying to distance themselves and have continued to try to distance themselves from the fact that Timothy McVeigh was a right wing extremist. At the same time, didn't Waco fuel his actions? Absolutely, absolutely, and and and. It, and it is true that McVeigh chose um, the date, um, April 19th, because it was the second anniversary uh, of Waco. But the, 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 to, to, to turn that into it's the fault of the people who were trying to deal with the situation in Waco, and obviously it did not work out well, and it was not a good moment for the FBI, but the idea that that somehow means they are responsible for Tim McVeigh's criminal act is is perverse in the extreme. Do you think Rush Limbaugh ever realized that Timothy McVeigh listened to him nonstop on these road trips? Uh, I I don't think he I, I don't think he did because frankly no one knew how um, passionately McVeigh followed Limbaugh until I found the records of it and his discussion of it in these, um, in these papers at the Briscoe Center at the University of Texas. I'm interested in what has galvanized the movement almost step by step leading to where it is today. After 9-11, our attention obviously turned overseas. While we weren't looking, was something nefarious happening? One of the things that really shocked me um, I have a I have a long epilogue in in Homegrown, which is uh, which chronicles not in a detailed way, but in a somewhat comprehensive way, all the right wing activity, uh, right wing violence that has taken place uh, during 
um, the subsequent during subsequent years. And one of the things you notice, and and the experts in the field have noticed, is that during Democratic administrations, right wing terrorism goes up. During Republican administrations, it goes down because the right wing is not so angry when George W. Bush is president. Um, and then it spikes dramatically when Barack Obama becomes president. This is not um, lone wolf activity, even if individuals are not working with others. Um, it is a movement that um, uses violence as a matter of course, and they are more active when Democrats are in power than when Republicans are. What is the state of sort of domestic terrorism today? Well, it's, um, you know, it, it, it has in recent years uh, moved largely to the form of mass shootings as opposed to bombs. Um, the, if you look at many of the mass shootings, not all of them, but, but many of them, whether it's, um, you know, shooting up uh, the, the, the gay nightclub in, in Orlando or the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh or the Walmart in El Paso or the grocery, uh, the grocery store. store in Buffalo. These are right wing extremists who were radicalized by the Internet. And uh, it is easy in this country to get your hands on a semi-automatic weapon, an assault weapon like AR-15s. And so many of these shootings have been with AR-15s. Uh, and and other uh, other assault weapons. That's where um, the focus is in terms of law enforcement lo looking for it. But it's very hard when there are thousands and thousands of AR-15s in circulation in this country. It's very easy to get one, and um, you know l law enforcement is uh, largely um, you know par well. It's not just that they're outgunned; they they have to react. Uh, you know, when I worked at CNN, uh, I will always remember uh, Brooke Baldwin, who was the anchor in the afternoon. Um, she, I remember one day during one of these many mass shootings, she said, you know, we have a, we co we have a way to cover this and we cover it. We, 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 have a, we, we know how to do this. And isn't that outrageous? I mean, we, there have been so many mass shootings. And anyone who tells you they can keep them apart and remember which is which is lying to you because there have been so many. And, you know, now, um, you know, we get the thoughts and prayers from the Republicans and talk, you know, vague talk about mental illness, but nothing ever changes. And uh, yes, it's not bombs at the moment, although it could be bombs again. But right wing extremism is now largely conducted through assault weapons rather than bombs like McVeigh, but the people are just as dead. We were hearing Rush Limbaugh connect Waco to Bill Clinton, but other Republicans have done that very effectively. Most recently, Donald Trump, who announced his candidacy in Waco uh, on the 30th anniversary of the siege there. So there is still this narrative out there that Waco was responsible for Oklahoma City. Well, and that Waco, in, in a broader sense, is an example of how the federal government is out of control. That the, the, the Waco is a synonym, as it was for McVeigh, of how uh, the deep state, the federal government, um, is a pernicious force in America. I mean, amazingly, uh, much of the right wing now believes that the FBI, the FBI of all government institutions, is some sort of left wing uh, hotbed uh, because of things like like Waco, and then obviously also leading into you know the investigations of Trump himself. But um, th this this is the world we live in, and and um, as incredible as it may seem, and and you know one reason I wrote Homegrown is this story of 1995 is a story of what's going on in the world in 2023. In fact, you write that the events of January 6, 2021, saw the full flowering of McVeigh's legacy in contemporary politics. Let's listen to Alex Jones just before the insurrection. The globalists are in fear. The globalists want to play God. They are not God. And the answer to their 1984 
The prologue to my book, the, 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 the chapter is called 1776, and one of the links between McVeigh and Alex Jones and, and the ex insurrectionists is this weird obsession with the Founding Fathers and the, the sense that our rebellion against the federal government is just like our forefathers' rebellion against the British. Uh, Timothy McVeigh had memorized much of the Declaration of Independence. Most people don't know much about the Declaration of Independence after the first famous opening. Much of the Declaration of Independence is a justification for why we were fighting the British. And um, this has become sort of right-wing right, right, right -wing code. Marjorie Taylor Greene talks about the, de the Declaration of Independence and the duty to rebel against tyrants. So when you think about the links between um, the uh, McVeigh, McVeigh and the um, January 6 people, it's not just a gun obsession. It's not just a belief in violence. It's a identification with the American Revolution and a justification for their actions, just like the people in 1776. I know you interviewed Merrick Garland for this. He wouldn't even utter the words January 6. Are you frustrated that once again we're seeing him be, being so cautious and as a result once again there's a vacuum where right-wing propaganda is filling the void? Well I, I am frustrated that he is not a more vocal presence on the on on the national stage. However, in fairness to Garland, that investigation of January 6th is not over. And Jack Smith, the, the uh, outside counsel who was supervising it, let's see what happens. Let's see if there are prosecutions other than the thousand people who actually went inside the Capitol. Um, I, I'm prepared to wait. I mean, I, I know as a former federal prosecutor, it seems like forever since January 6th because it's been two years. In an investigation of this magnitude with uncooperative witnesses, this is not that long an investigation. Um, I, it's got to be done by the end of 2023 because you know Donald Trump cannot be indicted in, in the middle of a in the middle of a active campaign. But I, I let's see. I mean, I, I'm just not prepared to criticize the end of investigation before there is an end of an investigation. One gruesome fact uh, in closing: Timothy McVeigh wanted his ashes spread over the Oklahoma City National Memorial, which is so disgusting. <laughs> it is. I, I got to say. First of all, he never, even if his lawyers hadn't talked th him out of it, that never could have happened. Well, it could have because. It could have. Well, it, it, I mean. Come on. Well, it, it, I mean. I mean, having been Wouldn't to Frank the Frank Keating say no well, way, Jose. But having having been to the memorial many times, you could just walk in there. I mean, it's it's very open to the public. Somebody with a with a canister could just. But he was. I mean, he was executed. I mean, it's. So but he, but his ashes didn't look any different from anyone else's. That it could have been done secretly. It absolutely oh. could have been done. It would not have been a ceremony. But you know that that is like that is open to the public. It it is a heinous, heinous, horrible idea. And fortunately, his lawyer, Rob Nye, talked him out of it. But I think it's, in, again, it shows how McVeigh had this theatrical sense of himself as a, as a man of, of um, historical significance. And uh, his desire to sort of have one last laugh over the, uh, the, the people that he had tormented um, was, you know, just showed what kind of person he was, which was evil, but also a, a kind of a, a, a theatrical is, is the word, I guess, that, that, that comes to mind. It's hard to believe that in 2025, it will be the anniversary 30 the thirty-year anniversary of the Oklahoma City bombing. How do you assess those thirty years? I mean, where are we now versus where we were then? Well, um, you know, I, I again, I, I think um, 
I don't want to say something good came of it, but you know, people of Oklahoma to this day they talk about the Oklahoma Standard, which is um, the the um, civic involvement and that that led to um, that, that that was part of the response, and and that is something that is worth I don't think celebrating is the right word, but at least recognizing. But you know, we are a country in, in, on on the negative side where right-wing violence is a persistent problem. It didn't start with Timothy McVeigh, but this attempt to sort of put McVeigh in a box as someone who was an aberration, that's why I wrote Homegrown, to show that he was not an aberration and that his legacy uh, lives on in, in both people and ideas that, that are persistent to this day. Jeff Tubin, homegrown, Timothy McVeigh and the Rise of Right Wing Extremism. It's a terrific book. Thank you so much for coming in to talk about it. Thanks, Katie.